Good afternoon, and welcome to St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. My name is Ann Sawyer, and I have the pleasure of being the rector of this parish. Today, uh, you, we're so pleased you join us for a St. Mark's, uniquely St. Mark's, social justice forum. And with us today, we will have uh, Dr. Yap Jacob, who is joining us from Scotland. Um, we are very honored to have Yap with us today. He is really um, a renowned historian, and today's guest uh, focus of attention will be slavery in Stuyvesant's world. Dr. Jacob is an honorary reader at the University of St. Andrews in, in Scotland. Uh, St. Andrews was founded in 1413 and is the third oldest institution. It's ranked number one as a university in Scotland and, and second, second in the United Kingdom. He has taught at Leiden University, the University of Amsterdam, Cornell University, the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard University, Brown, New York, New York University, Ohio University, among many others. Dr. Jacob uh, earned his PhD at Leiden University in 1991, 1999, 1999, and has written um, for the last two decades. He has published widely on New Netherlands and New Amsterdam, including um, several books, A Dutch Colony in 17th Century America and The Colony of New Netherland, A Dutch Settlement in the 17th Century America. He is currently working on a biography of Petra Stuyvesant. Today's uh, structure of our, uh, of our time together, we will hear from um, Yap in our presentation format for the first 25, 30 minutes, following uh, a time for question and answers. And we would ask that um, you uh, during the question and answers, that if you would like to ask a question, or if you have something that you would like to share, that you would put your name in the chat box. And you will be, um, when we come to that period of time, Morgan Roper, who chairs our anti-racism initiative here at St. Mark's, Act, Learn, and Pray, she will call on you. So you will be called on to ask your question at that time, or to offer whatever remarks that you have. We do ask that you keep those remarks to two minutes um, or less, and that's really just so that we can share the space and that we can hear from everyone who has questions to ask. We do hope that this is going to be just the first of several um, lectures that are going to, and, and talks and conversations that will happen over the course of the year, ideally once a month, um, with a variety of different historians based, it, based upon the topics that will be presented. Uh, today's topic and our conversation with Yap um, came together. We had a planning committee that included Mel Gibson, Liz Jacobs, Roger Walters, Susan Anderson Smith, and myself, talking with Yap about this topic and, and, and discerning how best to share information with all of you. So um, please know that based upon that conversation, we want this forum to be a conversation with each other. Um, we do want to share information presented by the historian, but then we want to be able to, to listen and to learn and to hear each other's stories and to tug at what is said um, so that we get the fullness and as we seek to understand the truth of the past and allow that to inform um, our present and our future together. There is no question that slavery was widely practiced by many New York families in the 17th and 18th centuries. Members of this parish um, owned enslaved people, for which we lament and we are committed to telling the story and from learning from history. Eventually, we hope to, as a parish, engage in dialogue and to discern how best um, to use and to care for the items that have been entrusted to us and how best to um, tell the truth of history uh, to all who come to visit this place. So, long before this church was built, Peter Stuyvesant owned this land. And so at this time, I'd like to invite you to tell us more. Thank you, Reverend Anne. Let me begin by sharing my screen.
there we are. And starting my PowerPoint, there we are. Right, I'm very honored to be with you here on the eve of Black History Month. And I've been to St. Mark's many a times and it's unfortunate that I cannot actually be with you in person um, because of the current pandemic. Um, but I have been at St. Mark's in 2006 and 2009 and some of you may actually remember one of my talks at that long time ago. Let me begin by, with a quote by Diana Berry, who's a historian. In a panel discussion um, four years ago, she asked concerning federal confederal document, the confederal uh, monuments, she asked, what is the historian's role in this moment? Her answer was to provide the context in which people can understand the very complex issues of the past and the present. And that is my role too. I hope that my historical insights will be, will be worthwhile as a worthwhile input in the conversation about St. Mark's and slavery. And I aim to ask questions rather than provide answers. I should also emphasize, and I, I will probably do it a couple of more times, that what I'm presenting is work in progress. These are not um, definitive answers to any questions relating to Stuyvesant. And as often is the case in historical research, we build upon work that others have done before us. And I need to mention in particular here, Dennis Maika, Jeroen de Wolf, Susanna Shaw Romney, uh, Andrea Mosterman, who ha actually has a forthcoming book going to be published this year with Cornell University Press, which will be very much of interest, I hope to you. And also I need to thank Charles Gearing, whose translations of the 17th century materials are excellent. The title of my talk tonight is Slavery in Stuyvesant's World. And I've chosen that title because it is quite capacious. It geographically covers both sides of the Dutch Atlantic. It covers the mental aspects, the worldview of Petrus Stuyvesant, his culture, his religion, and that shaped his view on slavery as it developed in his age and it guided his actions. Now, let me try to go to the next slide. Here we are. So, to Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant lived, of course, in the 17th century and spent most of his life in the Atlantic world. Um, that included, and let me see if I, if this works, I'm going one too far now, so I need to try to move back there, that's where I can do it. This is where the red circle is, this, that's the Dutch Republic. Stuyvesant was born in Friesland, he spent time in Amsterdam, and in the Dutch Republic, slavery was legally not allowed. Yet, as we know, black people were present in Amsterdam. This is a painting by Rembrandt made in the early 17th century, um, which is clear evidence of that, but there are, there are many other, um, as many as a lot more evidence of blacks being present in Amsterdam in the 17th century. In many cases, blacks were being used as servants and that in a way was a status symbol. It's uh, also a form of, of exoticism, like owning a parrot. It may not, they may not legally have been slaves, but their subservience was inescapable. They had, did not have any support network, so they couldn't actually literally escape from their situation. Now back to the Atlantic world. Let me give you some basic statistics about Dutch slave trade. You will know that the, the total number of slaves transported across the Atlantic was about 12 million. The Dutch share of that was about 5%. That's about 554,000. 
that's between 1606 and 1826. The bulk of that happened in the 18th century. And um, most of the enslaved people originated in West Africa, two thirds and one third in Angola, Luanga, and etc. The destination, and you can see that here with the red circles as well, was for 75% Suriname, Essequibo, Demerara, um, and Spanish America. Stuyvesant's career began in Dutch Brazil. He was at Recife, or at least we presume so, because there's no documentary evidence. The only evidence we actually have for him being in the area is being on uh, Fernando Noronha, which is the other red circle you can see. He was there in 1635. These islands were used for housing as enslaved people in the early 1630s. The Dutch had already captured part of Portuguese Brazil, but had been confined to uh, Recife. Once the entire captaincy of Pernambuco was in Dutch hand, the Dutch tried to restart the sugar production. The Portuguese had for decades relied on labor of black Africans on their sugar plantations there. So in 1637, the Dutch conquered the Portuguese slave trade entrepot Elmina, um, which remained in Dutch hands until 1871. So almost 250 years. Of course, the slave trade itself had already been stopped by that time. In 1639, so a few years later, Stuyvesant made a trip back to the Dutch Republic and then went to Curaçao, which is the westernmost red circle you can see. Curaçao had been conquered by the Dutch in 1634 to serve as a basis for the Dutch attacks by the Dutch West India Company on Iberian shipping and the Spanish and Portuguese colonies. Stuyvesant became director of Curaçao in 1642. In that year, he led a, an expedition to Maracaibo, Venezuela, and in 1645, he led another expedition to the island of St. Martin, where he was wounded, he lost his leg. In order to recover, he went back to the Dutch Republic. He visited Curaçao twice after in 1647 and 1655. After peace with Spain in 1648 and the fall of Dutch Brazil in 1654, Curaçao gradually became a transit port for the slave trade to Spanish colonies. By 1660, the volume of slave trade through Curaçao began to increase considerably. But of course, we mostly know about Stuyvesant because of his time in New Amsterdam, in New Netherland. Stuyvesant arrived in 1647 as Director General. By this time, New Netherland was a settlement colony, unlike any other Dutch colony of the time. The economy depended in part on agriculture with exports and in fur and tobacco paying for the imports that they received from the Dutch Republic. Despite the commercial and mercantile image that New Amsterdam now has, it was for many as also a religious refuge. The population in 1664 was about seven to 10,000. New Amsterdam, according to my estimates, must have been between 1,750 and 2,500 people. In 1655, there were, again, it's an estimate, about 150 enslaved and free blacks. By 1664, this has risen, had risen to 250, but it doubled with the arrival of the Gideon, a rare direct import from Africa with 290 people aboard. In 1664, about six to 8% of the colony of New Netherland had a black population. Uh, in New Amsterdam, the percentage was slightly higher, between 10 and 17%. Most of the enslaved were in the service of the Dutch West India Company. In uh, 1665 tax, tax list, we can see that only 12% were actually slaveholders. 
slavery in New Netherland is usually characterized by the, um, the half freedom, half slavery system, which uh, meant that the enslaved were made half free with conditions, annual payments, they were obliged to serve against pay if required, and most controversially, their children remained enslaved. This is common in New Netherland, but it is unknown elsewhere in the Dutch world. Many of the enslaved and free blacks were granted land along the Gemene Wagenweg, as it is called, the Common Wagon Road, which is Broadway. This was near Stuyvesant's farm, which was called the Bouwerij, nowadays the Bowery. Many of the freed and enslaved blacks enjoyed freedom of movement. They had legal rights, they could sue, for instance, and they had some protection against ill treatment. It is also important to realize that this was not chattel slavery, plantation style, as it began to develop in Virginia and Maryland, leading to a, a harsh reality in the 18th century. Still, African Americans in New Netherland had a very low status, whether they were enslaved or not. In all parts of Stuyvesant's world, slavery was visibly present, although these, these decades represent an early phase of the Dutch slavery system. So what may Stuyvesant have thought of slavery? We don't actually know. There are no direct sources, but there is some contextual information that we can use. In Stuyvesant's worldview, inequality in the world was attributed to God. Prosperity was a sign of God's favor in building the slavery system, European countries, including the Dutch Republic, made use of the Roman examples and the biblical examples of slavery. In, in the late 16th and early 17th century, the existence of slavery was already contested, uh, but opinions were changing. Jurists, including Hugo Grotius, nowadays proclaimed the founder of international law, accepted slavery and the slave trade. By 1640, the consensus among Calvinist theologians was that slavery was not incompatible with Calvinist principles. One of these theologians was Udemans, Cornelis Godefridus, uh, sorry, Godefridus Cornelis van Udemans. He based his ideas on several ideas, as a, his conclusion on several ideas. This is actually a, a portrait of Udemans as well. I'm using several portraits here. Some of them are not genuine, and I'll, I'll tell you about it. Others, such as this, this one, actually are. Udemans argued that the primacy, that, that spiritual liberty was far more important than corporeal liberty. The second point in his argumentation was the curse of Ham, going back to Genesis. And the third was the idea of a covenant between God and the Dutch Republic, making the Dutch, in fact, the chosen people. Actually, this is an idea that we see among other European countries, also England, for instance, as well. Udemans, however, formulated certain conditions for the acceptance of slavery. First, the slaves had to be treated properly. They were actually, in the view of Udemans, allowed to flee from cruel masters. Second, the slaves had to be taught the Christian faith, and that meant the Calvinism. And thirdly, there was a prohibition against selling the enslaved to Catholic countries. These conditions were formulated in the Dutch Republic in, by theologians. Um, eventually, these conditions crumbled under sustained pressure from the a system in which plantation economy was, became more and more reliant on slave labor. And, and this is a, a transformation that we see over the middle of the 17th century. And that wasn't as dominant in New Netherland as it was in Virginia and Maryland. So what is Stuyvesant's position 
in this system? What is his professional involvement as an administrator of the West India Company? And what is his personal involvement? Stuyvesant was primarily an administrator. His first position of influence was as director on Curaçao from 1642 until 1645. In those years, there were few enslaved on the islands, most likely from captured Spanish ships. The West India Company directors in Amsterdam entertained plans to expand the West India Company's involvement in the slave trade, but actually that had little result. From about 1660, Curaçao began to develop into a transport port for slave trade to Spanish colonies. And that is what its function turned out to be mostly in the 18th century. There was little involvement of this transformation from the part of Stuyvesant. Officially, he was in charge of Curaçao as well, but communication lines between Curaçao and New Amsterdam were very bad. So he could not actually do as much, and he couldn't exert as much influence on what was going on as he would have. His role in New Amsterdam was obviously much larger. By 1659, the West India Company wanted to send more enslaved people to New Netherlands, but the supply was relatively limited and there was more profit to be had by selling slaves to Spanish colonies and Caribbean islands. Uh, on the Caribbean islands, of course, at that point in time, the sugar plantations were becoming more important, pushing um, the growth of tobacco cultivation of tobacco to North American colonies, such as Virginia and Maryland. As I said, there was only a limited number of enslaved people in New Netherland and exporting them from New Netherland to Virginia and Maryland with its tobacco plantations was for the most part either prohibited or discouraged. From 1659, more enslaved began to arrive in New Netherland, partly from Curaçao, partly directly from Africa. It was the Amsterdam directors who initiated that. Stuyvesant was informed in order to find a good use for the people that were sent to him, either by keeping them in the service of the West India Company or by auctioning them off. One example of that is this letter. 1660, the 17th of February. Stuyvesant wrote to the vice director of Curaçao that concerning the blacks whom the Lord's directors order to send hither, they must be sturdy and strong men so that they can be put to work either at the fortress or in other works also, if they are suited to it, in the war against the wild neighbors, meaning the Indians, in this case, the Native Americans, either to capture them in pursuit or to transport the soldiers' baggage. This makes quite clear that Stuyvesant could use enslaved people for specific purposes. Stimulating the economy of New Netherland was a concern of Stuyvesant. The population growth was the main way for that. And actually in the late 1650s and 1660s, there was a considerable population growth in New Netherland. Yet that population growth did not actually result in a good prospects for a market for enslaved people, as Dennis Maike has pointed out in a recent article. Many Dutch colonists did not have the means to purchase slaves. They had only just arrived and were building their own lives. New Amsterdam merchants were interested in slave trade, either via Curaçao or directly from Africa, and they petitioned Stuyvesant for permission. Director General and Council did not have the power to grant it, so they referred it to the Amsterdam directors. But the Amsterdam directors at this point in time did not understand the potential for making New Amsterdam a transit point for slave trade to Virginia and Maryland. So it never really got off the ground. Even with the arrival of the Gideon, when, which was expected in 1664, there was no permission as yet for export. In May 1664, there was an auction in Amsterdam with 29 blacks being sold to 20 burghers of, Am of New Amsterdam. Interestingly, Stuyvesant was not one of the buyers, although members of his extended family were. For instance, Jacobus Bakker, the, um, who was uh, Stuyvesant's brother-in-law and Stuyvesant's nephew, Nicolas Verlet. 
So Stuyvesant was clearly involved in, in what was going on in New Amsterdam with his the slaves of the West India Company. He also owned slaves himself. That started probably in 1651 when he purchased the Bowery. And you can see that document or part of it here. He purchased the company's Bowery in New Netherland, above mentioned, with all the appurtenance belonging thereto, consisting of a house, barn, hayrick, land, six cows, two horses, and two young Negroes. In the red box, you can see the actual words in Dutch that are being used here. So this is clear evidence. Stuyvesant owned slaves. But how many did he own? That is actually quite a difficult question to answer. In many cases, the reply is 40. This is something you can find in much of the New Netherland literature, and it is mentioned in, in several places. Looking at the sources for this statement, we go back to a letter of Hendrikke Selijnes from the 4th of October, 1660. Now this is in Dutch, so I will not read it to you in full, um, but it does say, 40 negers, wiens land streken de negers kust is. 40 negros, who are from the Negro coast, that's Angola. So let me read the full excerpt and go to the next slide for that. In the morning, I preach in Brooklyn and following the sermon on the catechism in New Amsterdam at the Bowery, which is a place for recreation and pleasure in Manhattan. People from the town come there for evening prayers as well. In addition to the farmers, 40 blacks are present whose country of origin is the Negro coast. There is no consistory here as yet, but the deacons of New Amsterdam are receiving the arms for the time being, and if not an elder, at least a deacon will be elected. So this is what Henrique Selijns wrote in 1660, only a few months after he arrived. The portrait is a portrait of a different um, Dutch minister, but it is typical of the dress that he would have, that Selens too would have worn. This quote is very interesting because it doesn't actually say that Stuyvesant had slaves. Stuyvesant isn't even mentioned here. It doesn't even say that the blacks who are mentioned here are slaves, and that is typical. We know that many of the blacks that are referred to here lived in the village for, that was formed near the Bowery along, the, along Broadway. But many of those, if we look at later documents, are not actually owned by Stuyvesant, but by the West India Company. Some were already free or half free. Interestingly, there is no reference to a uh, to a chapel either, but a church organization is in the process of being set up. So this is a reason why some people say Stuyvesant has 40 slaves. And this goes back to this publication from 1901. Stuyvesant, um, uh, and I, and I leave it up there for you to read, but it actually says that for the accommodation of these people, as well as his own family and Negro slaves, of which there were about 40, the governor built a little chapel. You can see here how much of this is actually not in the document itself. Corwin, who translated the document and added this note to this publication, was born in 1834 and he was steeped in the unconscious racism of his time. He saw the word Negroes in the letter and unquestioningly assumed these were slaves, Stuyvesant slaves. However, the document does not address the status of the black people referred to, nor does it give any indication as to who might be the owner. The example of Corwin, 
shows how untrustworthy early translations and interpretations in many cases are. Historians should always be wary and seek to base their conclusions on their own research in the archives using primary sources in the original language. Free or enslaved status is often unclear in sources and neither is it always clear who the owner is. Let me give you another example of that. This is a letter of 1664, the 14th of October. And again, the, the, the portrait here is not of Jeremias van Rensselaer, there is no portrait of him, but it is typical of a merchant at that point in time. Jeremias writes, I bought a black man for the colony, he means his patroonship Rensselaerswijk upstate, from the honorable general Petrus Stuyvesant, but the said black had to remain a few weeks more in the company's service, so that I received him only a fortnight ago together with the black woman that the said general urged me to buy also, although he had given her to him later after I had bought the black man. She is a good sound wench. They cost the black man 400 guilders and the black woman 350 guilders in beavers. So who was the owner of the enslaved black men and women here? Most likely the West India Company, not Stuyvesant personally. As Director General, Stuyvesant obviously had a considerable say over the company slaves as well as over free blacks. And actually his insistence here that Jeremias van Rensselaer would not just take on the black slave, but also the wife is indicative of that. Also notice the date of this letter. It's October 1664, just after the English takeover of New Amsterdam in September 1664. Both the free and enslaved blacks, as well as Stuyvesant and many others, were aware that the West India Company's assets, including enslaved people, would be confiscated as government property. And this is where personal and professional in involvement become very much entangled. In earlier in 1664, in the early September, a number of half slaves of the West India Company were granted um, full freedom. They had been granted half freedom in 1663. This was now changed into full freedom. They had been promised full freedom when the fort would be finished. The fort, of course, being built to protect New Amsterdam against the English. They argued in their petition that two ships with slaves had since arrived. And they added that they had lived in fear since the arrival of the English ship just days earlier. Their request was granted. And I have to thank Dennis Micah for alerting me to this document. On the 11th of December, 1664, three months after the takeover, the enslaved people mentioned in this document um, were granted a certificate specifically to prevent them being delivered to the English. And then there's this document, 1665, 20 slash 30 April, that's because of the 10 days difference in the way that the calendar worked between the English and the Dutch. Land grants near the Bowery, made in 1659, 1660, when the village was formed there, um, were confirmed by Stuyvesant. This is only one part of one of five pages, I think it is, those four pages actually of this document with specifications as to the owners and locations of the, these parcels of land. It confirms the ownership of land of freed blacks, again, with the intention to prevent the new English colonial government from confiscating these lands. By this time, 1665, Stuyvesant was already out of office. So why did he do this? He didn't have to do this. One of the women who lived in this area, in the village around the Bowery, was Maiken van Angola. 
and I need to go back to this slide. Now, there is no portrait of Maike van Angola. This is one of the very few images that we have that is from the mid 17th century of a relatively young black woman. But this was made in Europe, in Antwerp actually, by Wenceslas Hollar, who was in the service of the Earl of Arundel, who was in Antwerp at the time. I presume, scholars presume I should say, because I haven't studied this myself in detail and I'm, I'm relying on others. It's presumed that this portrait as well as two other portraits are of servants of the Earl of Arundel. And it's unlikely that Maike would have been dressed similarly. This was the kind of dress for, for an Earl's servant. And yet I cannot leave her faceless. So I'm using this, but I do need to tell you that this is, it isn't actually her. Maike is an extraordinary woman. She arrived in New Netherland in 1628 with at least two other enslaved Angolan women, Lucretia and Susanna, as they were called. Notice that these are not African names. The minister Johannes Michaelius, who arrived in 1628 too, mentions the presence of enslaved Angolan women. Other members of this group of enslaved blacks from Angola, Angola Congo and Sao Tome were most likely taken when a Portuguese ship was captured by Dutch ships going to the Netherlands in 1628. Some of the males of this group from Angola were uh, involved in the collective murder of Jan Primero the, in an attempt to execute one of them, Ma Manuel de Gerrit de Reus, the ropes broke. And that is of an, an incident which of course is often referred to in the literature as well. By 1644, a number of them had received half freedom, freedom under conditions, including that their children, both those at present and yet to be born would remain slaves. This applied to 11 black people. Micah was not mentioned here, nor are her later husbands. By 1662, late December, three women, slaves asked to be manumitted. It was granted on condition that one of the three would come weekly to do the director general's housework, help in the housekeeping. Their names are mentioned, Lucretia, the wife of Francisco, Susanna, the wife of Peter Tambour, and Maike, the wife of Domingo. All three had arrived in 1628. And this is the text. They were humbly praying and requesting to be freed from the slavery in which they have been until now and to be granted free status. And they ended with this wish, acknowledging their due gratitude and considering themselves obliged to pray to the Lord God that his divine majesty will be pleased to continue your honors in long lasting health and a prosperous government. The plural is used here because they were not just addressing Stuyvesant, but the director general and council, a collective body. Notice also too, that they are submitting this request to the West India Company. Again, Maike is not a slave of Stuyvesant personally. The West India Company in Amsterdam actually had to grant permission for this request. Stuyvesant granted it provisionally on condition that, as I said, the three women would take turns in helping out in his household, presumably his household at the, at the Bowery. It took a while for an answer to arrive. In 1663, 19th of April, Micah petitioned again. She is the only one of the three women mentioned in the preview in this request to be still alive. She's an old and weak woman, usually ill because of an accident. And she reiterates that she had been a slave since 1628. She was in the end manumitted on the 17th of April, 1664. That manumission was along with her husband, Dominic Ang Domin Domingo Angola. They were both, are both described as late slaves in the company's service. And that is 
almost the last thing we hear about Maaike. We know that she was involved in raising a, a daughter, Susanna, someone else's daughter, I should add. But it isn't until 1689 that we hear from her again. At that point in time, Manuel Peters, the widower of Dorothea Dangola, marries Maaike Dangola most recently widow of Domingo d'Angola, both blacks living near Stuyvesant's Bowery. We don't know when Michael was born, so we don't know exactly how old she was in 1689. Most likely she was over 70. By 1689 she had been in New Amsterdam for more than 60 years. So, what do we make of Stuyvesant's involvement in slavery in his world? It's complicated. Research in primary sources is required to strip away the myth from the man. And yet, what I can give you is some preliminary conclusions. First, the slavery system of New Amsterdam was not plantation slavery like in Virginia. The chasm between black slaves and white slave owners was not as wide as it was later in the 18th and 19th century. Rather, it was a continuing, resembling a, a relationship of dependency with distinct elements of patronage. And uh, we can see that, for instance, in the reference to housework. Second, ownership is very, very often difficult to establish. The distinction between personal and professional involvement is also blurred. Stuyvesant undoubtedly profited from the labor of West India Company slaves, but the extent to which he did so remains uncertain. A third point is the role of Stuyvesant, is, sorry, is the role of the threat of an English takeover. Clearly, a, a change in the treatment of slaves was anticipated. This acted as a catalyst in New Amsterdam with a spate of manumissions and safeguards to preserve the property of freed blacks. Paradoxically, the transfer of enslaved from the West India Company to private slave owners, as for instance in the auction in May 1664, may have prevented their confiscation by the English and subsequent transportation to Virginia and Maryland. Finally, let me go back to Udemans and the conditions that he suggested for slaveholding. Good treatment, education in the Christian religion, and no, not, uh, no selling to the Catholics. Was this the model for Stuyvesant? The letter by Jeremies van Rensselaer gives an indication to that. He, Stuyvesant was not inclined to separate partners. The evening prayer at the Bowery with the black people living in the vicinity, probably participating, is an example of that too. Edification of African-Americans, free, half free of un or unfree was expected. Other documents that I'm not including here um, also pertain to the reluctance that Stuyvesant had in selling West Indian Company slaves to Catholic areas, whether those were in South America or in Maryland. So what is Stuyvesant's position in the world of slavery? I am inclined to think tentatively, because more research is required, that he appears to have shared the view, position of Udemans. Stuyvesant operated within an Atlantic slavery system, which he accepted in principle. By the middle of the 17th century, economic pressures, pressures such as the growth of tobacco plantations in Virginia and Maryland caused changes to that system, leading to a harsher treatment and greater inequalities. Stuyvesant appears to have pushed back against this as far as he was able to do so in his personal and professional capacities. And I need to emphasize these are provisional conclusions and they are also very likely to be quite different from what you ex would expect. There is need for more research here and more, and also research to be published after appropriate scholarly peer review. 
Stuyvesant, for all his faults, can be considered one of the men who shaped early New York. Yet Micah surely must be one of the black founding mothers of the city. She arrived in 1628 with at least two other women as members of a group of enslaved Angolas, Angolans. She outlived Stuyvesant and his wife, Judith, who are both buried under St. Mark's. It is possible that Micah and her husbands are also buried there. So does Micah deserve a statue? Thank you. Thank you, Yap. Morgan, would you like to, to begin our question and answer? <laughs> 